Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. The emails that ended John Gruden's tenure as coach of the Las Vegas Raiders were racist. They were homophobic. They were shameful. What I don't understand is what is the standard for the NFL for losing your job? It seems degrading and unacceptable words are enough. But domestic violence, sexual assault aren't? And shouldn't it matter that these comments were made in private emails from a personal account? Let me be clear. Using a racial trope towards the executive director of the National Football League's Player Association, Demore Smith, and calling NFL Commissioner Roger Goodell a homophobic slur are indefensible. But is the punishment consistent with NFL policy in other cases? Let's take the Cowboys running back, Ezekiel Elliott, suspended six games for allegedly striking a woman multiple times over the course of five days in July of 2016, causing injuries to her face, her arms, wrist, hands, knees, hips, neck, and shoulders. And uh, then there's quarterback Jameis Winston, who was suspended for three games in 2018 after an Uber driver accused him of inappropriately touching her in a sexual manner without her consent. He would later apologize for the incident. The list goes on and on. I mean, NFL cornerback uh, Adam Jones, who played in the NFL after beating an exotic dancer. Michael Vick, who played in the NFL for parts of seven or more seasons after spending time behind bars for dogfighting. Hall of Fame linebacker Ray Lewis, who missed no time for obstruction of justice in the stabbing death of two men. And now we have John Gruden, who resigned last night as head coach of the Raiders after personal emails from 2011 to 18 were uncovered as part of an internal NFL investigation surrounding the Washington football team, having nothing to do with him, were leaked to the media. Many of the emails had been sent to Bruce Allen, the Washington team's then president. Gruden, who most notably led the Tampa Bay Buccaneers to their first ever Super Bowl title in 2002, could now find himself exiled from the NFL forever. Let me say this. John Gruden's career is over. It's over. There's certain things that we are the land of second chances. Mm -hmm. People make mistakes all the time, and we get all of that. But I cannot imagine even a white male with influence and connections and some degree of power that can overcome what the New York Times reported and what we all now know. Is it because he's a coach? So the standard is higher? Or is it because criminal conduct is not as considered as serious as words that hurt people who can hurt the NFL business? I also remain concerned about the way that these emails were leaked. It appears they were almost weaponized. To be clear, I don't think the Raiders had any other choice but to part ways with him. But why is no one asking tougher questions of the NFL about punishments fitting the crime and about how and why these emails were leaked? Joining me now is Anthony Tall, an attorney, sports agent, and president and founder of Miracle Sports. Anthony, thanks so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. Good. Thank you, Dan. So, I worry that the standard for discipline in the NFL is less focused on right and wrong and more focused on what is riskiest for the NFL brand. Am I wrong? To a certain extent, you're wrong. I, I think I think you you hit the point, the nail on the head when you first said that. Uh, this is a coach, so he's going to be held to a higher standard. Uh, he's held to a higher standard than some 20-year-old, 21-year-old player out there drinking and driving, getting in an argument with his girlfriend. And it's a financial issue when the players are coming into the locker room. They have to see this guy as a role model so they can model themselves to not do what he does. So in that regard, it's different. Now, there are different standards. Obviously, if you're Lamar Jackson or if you're – uh, Patrick Mahomes, the NFL is going to take his time and discipline you differently than they will just so your run-of-the-mill player. So obviously those standards are there. But in this situation, the most important thing to remember is that this is a coach, and the NFL could not have his brand attached to that. It's even more difficult to argue. It's even more difficult to argue uh, Ray Rice uh, has more of a second chance than an NFL coach. And I was... Uh, particularly in belief that he shouldn't have lost his job after the first email came out. But then after you find out that it goes from 2011 to 2018, and you find out right. that it's a pattern, that's when I knew that the NFL brand could not survive it, so they were going to have to but, part but, ways with this guy. And, and I agree with you. I don't think there was any way that the brand could have survived this, right? But you bring up a very interesting point, which is that there was one email that was leaked first, right? 
And it almost seems like it was a warning shot. It was basically saying, here's the first one. Let's see if he resigns. Then he doesn't resign. And then, and then they dump more of the emails out to make sure that he finally resigned. I mean, it's a little conspiratorial, I get it, but it does seem like there was someone who was determined to leak just enough of the emails and keep it just focused on him, not on any of the other people where these emails, the person the email was to, et cetera. Doesn't that concern you about the way that this went down? Yeah, I, that, now that does concern me, Dan, and I think you make a really good point. I also think you need to take into consideration that this was a Friday evening that he came out. So they're traveling, the team is, is uh, getting ready for a game. They didn't want to get rid of him on Sunday because, again, these games are so important in this league and there's so much money. So they wanted to, it came out late on a Friday, the team is traveling, they have a game on Sunday. But I do agree with you that I do think at the timing and the way they were released, it looks as if they waited until Monday after the game to say, okay, here's everything else. It's kind of like you have the first accuser come forward and everybody's like, well, it's just one. And then you wait till Monday, Tuesday, you get three, four, and then that's when the guy right. is done. So I agree with you there. And, and, and it does feel like, I mean, that, that part of the problem here, obviously the language, as we both agree, is to the point where the, the, the NFL brand, right, there's good, they just can't stick around. But, but, you know, Gruden attacked Goodell, um, the NFL commissioner, in some of these emails. And again, if there's this sense that it's the NFL who's leaking, I mean, who is leaking it? That's what I don't understand. Who's leaking this? Inf it's an internal investigation into Washington. He wasn't the coach of Washington. So who is leaking this information just about him, right? I mean, who's got access to it? These are important questions that aren't being answered. And that's, and that's a great point. I do think those questions will be answered. And I do think you're going to, will be, will be at least be probed. And I do think you'll be hearing about the recipients of these emails in the days to come and whether their response was, oh, you can't, shouldn't be saying that, which, we, which it appears it was not, that was not the case. So I think there will be more, more casualties, so to speak, in this situation. But I do have an issue with them being released to the New York Times, the way they came out. Um, and I do think the, the work that needs to be done now is we need to uh, find out Who's leaking them? Obviously, it's the, obviously, it's the NFL and it's someone from the front office. But the well, way, the manner in which they're being used is weaponized to, but, to, uh, right. to piggyback on but your that's point. that's a big deal, right? I mean, it's a Absolutely. big deal. You just said someone from the NFL is leaking this stuff in an effort and, again, selectively doing it in a way to ensure we just get enough out there to get rid of the guy and not release any of the other stuff. Let me ask you this, Anthony, if you could stick around for a minute because I know the great news is you're also a lawyer, so we want to talk to some of the legal issues uh, with you about this. So uh, uh, stick around if you can. Um, and coming up, today we learned the cause of death of Gabby Petito. It is more bad news for Brian Laundry, but that isn't stopping Laundry's attorney from suggesting that Brian Laundry isn't really the suspect. Coming up. Welcome back. We're talking about John Gruden, now the former coach of the Las Vegas Raiders. And I want to play you what my guest on my radio show on Sirius XM said today about the NFL weaponizing the emails. Here is NFL analyst Mike Florio. I think it was deliberately leaked by the league. And then when John Gruden didn't resign and wasn't fired over the weekend, when he knew or should have known there was more stuff coming, they started leaking more. And I think they were going to keep leaking it, Dan, until... The owner of the team fired Gruden or Gruden walked away. There is so much to talk about. Anthony Tall is still with us and joining us is Los Angeles based defense attorney, legal analyst Dana Cole. Dana, great to see you again. It's been a long time. It's been um, a long time. Right. Nice to see you, Dan. <laughs> um, Anthony, let me just get one more question to you about the specifics of a contract like this. This guy had a $10 million contract, sorry, $100 million contract over 10 years, and it was supposed to go through 2028. He stepped down, but what happens now contractually? Well, that's a great point. I imagine there'll be some type of arbitration, but this was guaranteed money. So this was guaranteed money. So the issue now becomes whether or not he was forced to, to resign 
or resign because I'm sure in that contract it says that he is to fulfill our duties. However, if they were to fire him, his money would be guaranteed. So I think there'll be some type of arbitration. They'll meet halfway. He'll get half of it. But this was a huge contract for John Gruden, which I assume had a lot to do with why he didn't resign after Friday evening, right, along right, with the other right, reasons. Right. <laughs> I'll bet. I'll bet. Dan, Dana Cole, when, you, when they're doing an internal investigation like this, right, it's a lawyer. Beth Wilkinson, very prominent lawyer uh, who's leading this investigation of the Washington team. What happens to the emails? I mean, this isn't like a formal thing where they have to turn it over or they have to do something specific with it. Who has access to these kinds of emails in this kind of internal investigation? Well, in any high profile investigation, things are always subject to leaks. You know, if we've learned anything from Washington politics, we know that things leak out. And in this type of case, you know, this is high profile. He's a head coach. And, uh, you know, this is uh, uh, very uh, sensitive and, uh, you know, shocking types of uh, communications. And a real Neanderthal type of mindset that's being expressed here. And so whoever sort of, whether it's uh, office staff or whether it's right. attorneys, you never know, but someone gets their hands on it and they let it go. And why shouldn't but Dana, they? If you're, if you're the lawyer who's leading this investigation and you now read about emails that have been leaked in a clear effort to, to punish this guy, do you get angry as the lawyer who's leading the investigation? And do you say to people, this is not what I signed up for? Uh, not really. I mean, it's all part of the territory if you want to know the truth. When you're, you know, in the operating in the big leagues, things like this happen and you have to adjust. Uh, you know, if, if stuff gets out eventually anyway. So, you know, this may have been a premature release, I agree. But still, ultimately, this stuff is destined to get out. But, because but, the it's but here's the problem. But Dana, here's the problem. What makes this different? They're not issuing a report here, right? There, it, it's, I mean, that's the amazing thing is that you would think with this kind of investigation where the guy's losing his job, right, that at the least we would have a report that would say, OK, here's the conclusions we've reached. They're not even issuing a report. OK, but let's analyze this for a second. Let's say it was it remained highly confidential, but he still loses his job. Aren't reporters like yourself going to then ask why and then people are going to dig and dig and ultimately it's going to come out anyway. That's just the nature of the business. That's yeah. what happens. But that's not the questions people are asking now. And I guess the, the point that I'm trying to make is that I'm focusing on two broad issues. One is whether the punishments fit the crime broadly in the NFL, meaning is there a level of consistency amongst the punishments? And issue two is about personal emails being used and as, uh, as Florio pointed out, weaponized. There is something about that that rubs me the wrong way and no one is talking about that, that they're just sort of, oh yeah, well, it's as if he made a, he held a press conference and made these sort of racist and homophobic comments and people said, well, of course he's gotta be fired. These were private emails. That doesn't, I'm not saying, therefore it changes what they have to do. I get it. It means that we now know his mindset and he's gone. But can't we at least be troubled by this, Dana? We can, and can cancel culture bothers a lot of people. But frankly, um, you have to get with the times. It started with uh, gay marriage. It went to Me Too. And now it's Black Lives Matter. The world is changing. People have to get with the program. And if they don't, it's goodbye. Well, That's just the way well, that, it works. I, I, well, but, but, but Anthony, uh, final point on this. Remember, these are from 2011 to 2018. I'm not suggesting it, therefore, it was okay in 2015. But go ahead, Anthony, final word on this. Well, I just want to say to Dana, I mean, you got to remember that, that it is important here because we've seen the same thing in a, in a not so direct way happen to Donald Sterling, where he's having a private conversation at home with his girl and a girlfriend and under California law record that recording is illegal. And he had to sell and, and his Rachel team. Nichols. Yeah. What about and Rachel, Rachel Nichols? Nich and Rachel Nichols. Yeah, as well. I mean, he had to sell his team and Rachel Nichols ended up resigning. So. We're right. not concerned with I mean, these issues that Dan are raising. We haven't had any, I didn't hear any of those discussions uh, on ESPN this thank morning. Thank you. 
That is why I'm trying to do a show that is different, where we talk about things other people aren't talking about. Absolutely. Dana, Anthony, thank you both so much for coming on the show. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. The cause of death for Gabby Petito has been announced. It tells us more about the timeline, and none of it is good news for Brian Laundrie. It's up next. Welcome back. We now know Gabby Petito died as a result of strangulation. And anyone who knows this type of investigation knows that is more bad news for Brian Laundrie. Teton County Coroner Dr. Brent Blue made the announcement today. We hereby find the cause and manner of death to be the cause of death by strangulation and manner is homicide. Dr. Blue also said uh, that Gabby died three to four weeks before her body was found September 19th near an undeveloped camping area along the border of Grand Teton National Park. I'll explain why that's important in a moment. So here's what we know in terms of the timeline. Okay, Brian and Gabby were last seen together on August 27th at a restaurant. On August 30th, Gabby's mom received her last supposed text from Gabby. Her mom describes it as an odd text and is not sure who even sent it. Then two days later, on September 1st, Brian Laundrie returned to his parents' home in Northport, Florida, in Gabby's van without her. On September 11th, Gabby's family reports her missing. Six days later, the Laundrie family reports Brian missing, saying they last saw him on September 13th. And then Gabby's body is found on September the 19th. So three to four weeks before that, as the coroner suggests, puts Gabby's death squarely around the last time Brian was seen with her. At this point, the manhunt for Brian Laundrie continues. For now, he's just charged with unauthorized use of a debit card belonging to Gabby Petito. Laundrie's lawyer, Stephen Berlino, really wanted to focus on that, making this statement. He said, quote, Gabby Petito's death at such a young age is a tragedy. While Brian Laundrie is currently charged with the unauthorized use of a debit card belonging to Gabby, Brian is only considered a person of interest in relation to Gabby Petito's demise. At this time, Brian is still missing, and when he's located, he will address the pending fraud charge against him. Let's be clear, that is nonsense. The notion that when Brian is found that he will just be tried for the debit card fraud is a defense attorney's pipe dream. I find it a lot he used the word demise. But I think maybe it may be time for Laundrie's lawyer not to comment at all until Brian is found. Joining me now is Tracy Wilder, former CIA officer and FBI special agent. Tracy, thank you so much for coming on the show. Appreciate it. So, so many people ask me this question, and I try and provide some form of an answer to it, um, but I don't have a perfectly determinative or thorough answer to it, which is why haven't they yet formally charged Brian Laundrie with Gabby's murder? I think maybe we're having an audio issue. Can you hear me? Yes. Oh, great. Okay. So let me ask you again. Um, I was just talking about uh, people asking me all the time, why Brian Laundrie hasn't been formally charged. What's your explanation that you provide to people when they ask you that question? So the explanation that I like to provide to people is, is really one that was, was I experienced um, when working at the FBI. I remember being a new agent and my first case that I had to go to um, in front of the grand jury to, pr to present, um, my, my SSA or my supervisory special agent said to me, if you don't get an indictment, don't bother coming back to work. Um, and I think that's really something that the FBI takes very seriously in that they are really wanting to get all their ducks in a row um, and really wanting this, this aura of perfection almost um, around the evidence. And that is something that I experienced, quite frankly, as a special agent there. So I'm honestly not that surprised. Right. And I think that the key is, what I say to people is, look, there's an arrest warrant out for him. They are using the full force of law enforcement to find him as if he was a murder suspect. And that is why it is so disingenuous for his lawyer to say, oh, you know, when he comes back, he's going to be ready to address that bank fraud charge as if that's the, the real uh, charge here. Um, 
anything in the coroner's finding today of strangulation that you think changes the case in any way? I'm not sure that it necessarily changes the case, but to me, what this really solidifies is that this is an act of domestic violence. I mean, it really what we see in strangulation cases, um, I've, I've worked with a couple of victims in a different state. It's really the leading cause of death amongst women um, in, in certain states. And really what we tend to see are things like choking, things like manual strangulation, which is exactly what her cause of death is. That's really what I what I unfortunately expected um, to hear. So it really solidifies to me um, that this is a domestic abuse case. Yeah, and I don't mean to get too gruesome here, but what people forget is how hard it is to strangle someone to death. It's it extremely actually, Yeah, talk about it, please. Yeah. So, you know, strangulation, we, you know, we talk about, and again, I don't, I don't mean to get too gruesome. Um, you know, we talk about, it, I don't want to say it's easy, but, you know, shooting someone with a gun, you know, we're taught really depersonalizes a crime. You're not necessarily putting your hands on someone. You can shoot and kill someone yards and yards away, up to 10 yards away. Um, but you know, straddling someone, putting your hands around their neck and looking at them and looking in their eyes until they stop breathing is deeply, deeply personal and is always, you know, perpetrated by someone that the person knows. Yep. So everything we learned today from the timeline to the cause of death, as I said before, is more bad news for Brian Laundry. Tracy, yes. thank you very much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Hope to have you back. Thank you for having me. Coming up. We were driving, he shot at the car. Cops catch up with a suspected shooter, and he comes at them armed with a gun. We'll talk live to the police chief about the shootout. Time for our police cam report, showing you the dangers police face across the country every day. Tonight, we're getting a look at what happened after a suspect opened fire on a car near a Walmart in California, and we get to hear the 911 call. I want to warn you, the video may be disturbing to some viewers. There's this dude that had a gun inside his car. He was drinking, uh -huh. and we were, we were driving, and he shot at the car. And where did this happen? And it happened in, um, next to Walmart, next to Walmart, but right now we're going to the hospital. So this person that shot at your car, did you know yeah, him? No, we don't know him. Okay. He shot, up the, he shot the car and he shot one of um, my sister's boyfriend in the back. Fortunately, the, the victim drove to the hospital for treatment and was released a short time later. The passenger who called 911 was able to give the license plate number of the shooter's vehicle. Police found the white Mercedes SUV near the owner's home. Then the suspect led police on a chase topping 100 miles an hour. Just past the gate, continuing southbound. Speed's about 60 on my end. No traffic right now. TC at Encino. My vehicle's 10-7. Shots fired, code three cover, S1 is down. So let's slow it down. The shooting lasted a little more than three seconds. The suspect, Jonathan Carroll, crashed, then got out of the vehicle and fired two shots. Officer Chandler Hoppel fired 12 rounds. More officers responded. Hoppel was not injured, was moved from the immediate area. Police advanced on the suspect, found him unresponsive. Carroll was later pronounced dead at the hospital. One officer wearing gloves then takes the gun from under him removes the ammo, including a bullet in the chamber. The weapon was found to be without a serial number, also known as a ghost gun. Carroll had another unregulated gun in the car, a semi-automatic rifle, and a bag full of ammo. With us more, uh, with more on this incident and the investigation is Escondido, California Police Chief Ed Varso. Chief, thanks a lot for taking the time. Appreciate it. So where does Absolutely. the investigation, where does the investigation stand now? So right now, uh, my crimes of violence team is now charged with investigating everything from the very beginning with the first uh, shooting involving uh, this innocent party to the decisions and actions of law enforcement in this case. And then once that investigation is complete, we really go into a detailed analysis of everything involved. Uh, then ultimately it'll be turned over to the San Diego County District Attorney's Office and they will be responsible for making the final determination as to the legality of the shooting. 
So the suspect crashed, then the officer blew out his front tires. As the officer gets out of the car, the suspect and officer exchange fire. I want to just take one more look at that for a moment. It, TC at it all lasted. My vehicle's 10 7. Shots fired. Code 3 cover. S1 is down. It all lasted a little more than three seconds. Do you have any sense at this point of a motive uh, for the shooter? You know, I don't know if we're ever going to really understand the motives uh, that led Jonathan Carroll to make the decisions that he did that day. Uh, we do not see any information that indicates that there's any relationship at all between Carroll and the innocent victims in this case. We truly believe that they're an innocent party. There was nothing that led up or motivated the shooting to begin with. And it is kind of amazing that this the, the person was able to be stopped because a passenger in the first vehicle noted the license plate. Yes, absolutely. And that was a critical piece of this. You know, uh, Escondido has about 152,000 residents. We are just outside of the San Diego area. So without that license plate number, we would probably have nothing more than a vague description of a white SUV or a white Mercedes maybe, which then quickly becomes a, a needle in the haystack kind of scenario for us. So in this case, that license plate was critical to us being able to quickly identify the suspect involved in this shooting. And, and I truly believe the officer's actions prevented further injury or death even to community members or other members of law enforcement. You know, when we first did this script, we were talking in the script about the fact that Officer Hoppel was moved out of the immediate area. And I didn't even understand what, what the point of that was, but that was actually a very specific thing that was done there. Talk to us about that. Absolutely. That's a, it's a very intentional decision that we make when we're handling these kind of critical incidents. And, and, and it's done for a couple of reasons. The first off is as that a team of officers arrives on scene, they do not necessarily know what you just witnessed in the body cam footage. All they know is that there's been an officer involved shooting and what's been relayed by officer hop will be a radio. So they're showing up and that scene's still not secure. And, until that suspect is handcuffed and we disarm them. Uh, so as that's happening, as we get more officers on scene, it's very common for us to then uh, move the officer involved in it out of the immediate area because one, we're checking on that officer's injuries as well. We don't know if they've been hurt. And it's not uncommon for a law enforcement officer to be involved in an incident like this, sustain some sort of injury and not even realize it until after the fact. So we're looking out for the officer to make sure they're not injured and then also giving them an opportunity to begin to decompress a little bit after going through something that's life threatening and intense. Chief Varso, thank you so much uh, for joining us and providing this insight um, into this. An amazing moment. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Coming up, dueling editorials in the New York Times and Washington Post have Republicans coming out and supporting Democrats in 2024, saying they can't back a party that's standing by former President Trump. But this just sounds more like never Trumpers in the Beltway bubble rather than a national movement. But maybe I'm wrong. The good news is my guest is going to know. Coming up. We're back when the New York Times and Washington Post publish op-eds with basically the same exact premise on the very same day, it's hard not to take notice. But when they're both about Donald Trump, I wonder if they should be taken with a grain or shaker of salt. The pieces in question ran Monday in the Times and the Post and are written by right-leaning moderates, disenchanted and fearful about the future of the Republican Party. Both op-eds called for voters to cast their ballots for Democrats. Quote, I have no faith that we'll remain a democracy if Republicans win power, national security columnist Max Boot wrote in the Washington Post. Thus, although I'm not a Democrat, I will continue to vote exclusively for Democrats, as I've done in every election since 2016, until the GOP ceases to pose an existential threat to our freedom. The Times editorial was co-authored by Republican former New Jersey Governor Christine Todd Whitman and former Homeland Security official Miles Taylor, better known as the anonymous member of the Trump administration who criticized the former president's leadership in a scathing column and book. 
Now, while Max Boot no longer identifies as a Republican, Whitman and Taylor still identify with the GOP. Their op-ed was actually titled, We Are Republicans. There's only one way to save our party from pro-Trump extremists. Quote, many of us have spent years battling the left over government's role in society, and we will continue to have disagreements on fundamental issues like infrastructure, spending, taxes, and national security. But we agree on something more foundational, democracy. We cannot tolerate the continued hijacking of a major U.S. political party by those who seek to tear down our republic's guardrails or who are willing to put one man's interest ahead of the country. Now, if these op-eds were about anything other than Donald Trump, they would have rocked the political world. But as I look at them in the big picture, I wonder, is this just more inside the media talk from never Trumpers? Christine Todd Whitman believes she's tapping into a significant demographic Monday on CNN, of course. She argued that her message is reaching disaffected conservatives. The response to the, to the letter, to the op-ed, I should say, has been really strong of people saying, finally, thank you, yes, we need to do this. Of course, there have been the naysayers, and I mean, they're going to they're gonna say whatever they're going to say and dismiss us. But there are literally, as Miles mentioned, thousands, tens of thousands of Republicans who have left the party. And you can see it in the registration numbers. The re Republican registration overall is going down. It's the independents and the unaffiliated who are going up. And many of those, mo I would guess most of those, are Republicans who just don't feel this is their party anymore. As you all know, I embrace, I welcome talk of moderation. And I wish moderation was a growing movement on both sides. There's no doubt that what, it's what we need in this country. I think more moderates, more leaders willing to compromise and not be controlled by the most radical part of their party. But despite the Times and Post publishing these op-eds on the same day, I'm just not convinced that this is the movement uh, that, the, uh, that Governor Whitman seems to think it is. But joining us now to tell me whether I'm right is Doug Schoen, a longtime Democratic consultant and pollster. Doug, good to see you, my friend. So am I, uh, am I wrong about this? I mean, is, is this the making of a movement? Dan, I wish I could tell you you were wrong. That being said, I think this is inside the beltway uh, rhetoric that, frankly, has no great significance. As we sit here today, Trump is at least even with, if not ahead of Biden in the polls. The trends for 2022 favor the Republicans, certainly in the House, probably in the Senate, too. And we're seeing more and more party voting as time goes on. And I wish I could tell you there was this trend to Republicans rejecting Trump, but I don't see it in any of the data I see. Because, I mean, the, the latest poll that I saw, and again, these polls, you know, can change by the day, but Trump's favorability within the GOP, you know, uh, the latest Politico morning consult poll, 84 percent, it seems Correct. that in the vast majority of polls, it's somewhere between 80 and 90 percent favorability among Republicans for Donald Trump. And Republicans have invariably followed Trump. And if you look at some of the retirements of House members, uh, those that voted among the 10 to impeach, a number of them have retired. Uh, Liz Cheney in Wyoming is going to be in a very tough race. And frankly, we sit in a situation where I hate to say it because I'm not a supporter of Donald Trump. I'm a Democrat, a moderate. And I believe like you in unity. But I think Trump is, if anything, stronger than ever before, largely because of Democratic division and Democratic weakness. But I do think that if in 2022 the Republicans, um, you know, take the Congress, um, I think that that could change the equation. I think that, is, that could potentially lead more moderates to say, the people who like the balance, right? They like the balance mm -hmm. of power between the Congress and the president, right? That's, that's certainly possible, Dan. I don't rule it out. What I thought in the op-eds made some sense, I think it was in the Whitman and Taylor one, was the notion of strategic endorsements, endorsing an independent in Utah, endorsing moderate Democrats in swing districts. I thought that was a hopeful development where a few thousand votes or some extra money could make a difference. But is this going to lead to a wholesale rejection of Donald Trump? I don't think so. He's running in 2024, right? I don't think there's any doubt about it. But for 
a legal problem that precludes him from running, I think he'll be on the ballot. I think he'll be the Republican nominee. And I think it's at least as we sit here today, 50-50 whether he wins. I, sh I should have had you on the show when I, because I'm out of time to talk about this question. I'm going to tease it. and I'm going to have you back to talk about it another time about whether the, if he gets indicted in Manhattan, that could actually help him uh, politically. Doug Schoen, thank you. It could well, Dan. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate it. There, there's the answer. Um, right. Doug, great to see you. Jeff Bezos going after Jeff Bezos? The Washington Post slams his space tourism company for its toxic work culture, which is interesting since, of course, he owns the Post. But then why didn't the cable newsers mention it when they were all fawning over Jeff Bezos today? It's in Mediaite Moments coming up next. Before we get to our Jeff Bezos Mediaite Moments, just minutes away on News Nation Prime, hear from the Good Samaritan who stopped a kidnapping in progress caught on camera saving a three-year-old girl snatched while walking with her grandmother on a New York City street in broad daylight. He's opening up at the horrific incident and telling Marnie Hughes how it all unfolded. That's next on News Nation Prime. Time now for our Mediate Moments, where we check in on the day's bias, buzz, and bull in the world of cable news and beyond. The Washington Post had a massive scoop yesterday that Blue Origins, also known as the space travel company owned by richest person in the world, Jeff Bezos, is a really toxic work environment. The expose was based on an internal memo sent from a mid-level manager to the CEO that described, quote, our current culture is toxic to our success and many can see it spreading throughout the company. The Washington Post's damning article reads in part, the new management's authoritarian bro culture, as one former employee put it, affected how decisions were made and permeated the institution, translating into condescending, sometimes humiliating comments and harassment towards some women in a stagnant top-down hierarchy that frustrated many employees. Now, what makes this report particularly interesting is that the Washington Post is, of course, owned by the same multi-billionaire who owns Blue Origins, Jeff Bezos. So bravo to the Post for going all in on the story, even when the subject is the owner of your paper, i.e., your boss. But if you're watching cable news today, you might not even know that the Washington Post story broke. We looked and it seems that there were zero mentions of the Washington Post story since it went live Monday, mo Monday morning. Instead, there was this. Jeff Bezos of Blue Origin is slated to send William Shatner, of course, well known as Captain Kirk on Star Trek, part of the crew that's heading to space on Wednesday. The Shatner says he was personally invited by Jeff Bezos to take part in the mission. Without that show and all the success, he wouldn't be going up today as a guest of Jeff Bezos. Uh, Jeff Bezos' vision is really a remarkable practical one. Look, it is entertaining that Captain Kirk is going into space tomorrow. I get it. It's a great story. And cable news outlets will hope to get viewers covering a 90-year-old celebrity going into space. But underneath this is the undeniable truth that the media is obsessed with Jeff Bezos. And the lack of coverage of this blockbuster report about the very space company that everyone is talking about today is pretty telling about the media landscape. And fresh off his trip to space, he wants more. Jeff Bezos is now setting his sights on the moon with an aggressive new move. Super influential company with what is now one of the most politically powerful people in America, the billionaire Bezos. Stay with me. Whatever became of that guy, <laughs> Jeff Bezos. All the people who question and second guess Jeff Bezos, who's spreading himself too thin, going too far. I think he did okay. Uh, I mean, it was a brilliant move by Bezos. It really was. Yes. Yes, yes, I get it, it was. But what is behind the media's love fest with the one billionaire, quote, good guy? Three reasons in my view. He's one of them, us, owning a beloved media property. He's progressive, and this one's a little conspiratorial, but he's super wealthy and can personally drive massive ad buys. Now, whether number three applies or not, it's clear he is celebrated by the media. But do you know what else broke today about Jeff Bezos? He is no longer 
the richest man in the world. All right, you know, when you ask some of the world's richest people, do they count their billions, they always say no, uh, but they do. I'm telling you, they do. Then there's Elon Musk, who relishes now uh, knowing that he is the world's richest man and has eclipsed Jeff Bezos, namely because of the jump in, in Tesla's stock. You heard that right. As of today, Jeff Bezos is no longer number one. That goes to Elon Musk. Well, you know, if he isn't the richest guy anymore, maybe it's time to fawn over the other guy with the space company. That's our wrap-up of the day's media bias, buzz, and the bull, our mediaite moments. That does it for us tonight. See you back here tomorrow for another edition of Dan Abrams Live. We're already debating the topics, by the way, on email during the commercial breaks for what we should do tomorrow. That's how much in advance we're planning. News Nation Prime starts right now.